Hi, everybody. I'm Jody H. Sexton, author of American Rule, How Nation Conquered the World but Failed Its People, co-host of the Muckrake Podcast, and uh, here on this YouTube, YouTube channel, the host of the Bourbon Talk political Q&A most Sundays at 8 p.m. Eastern, where you can ask me questions and uh, talk about some of the current events taking place. I really appreciate you coming out tonight on a Saturday. It's a weird time, but these are nothing if not weird times. I wanted to take a um, I wanted to take an opportunity to talk about what happened this week and what is going on in this country. Uh, I've been pretty frustrated recently by the discourse around this situation and the inability of politicians and the media to correctly diagnose, explain, and have a conversation about exactly what's going on, because it's really complicated. It's a really bizarre, weird situation, and we're not really given the language to discuss it, uh, because a lot of what we're dealing with right now is uh, weirdly philosophical. It's soaked in myths and long running lies. Uh, you have to understand a lot of history, a lot of uh, political science and background. Uh, and, and there was a reason why Wednesday felt so strange, not just in the idea that something like this could take place, but how it actually carried itself out. And what we saw play out on our television screens and in videos and pictures that leaked during and afterward, uh, it, it felt like an absolute maelstrom of nonsensical, violent, esoteric behavior. And unless you've been following this stuff, unless you're versed in it, unless you have been sort of, I don't know, living and breathing this stuff for the past few years, it's a little hard to understand and to wrap your head around. And, and that's both by design, but also a symptom of what has been going on over the past few years in the last few decades. So I wanted to do this live stream, this uh, special that I'm calling the Capital Pooch of 2021, sort of as a bit of a, a primer or an explainer to kind of go through exactly what we watched take place on January 6th in Washington, DC, but to also give people a little bit of an explanation of where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. Um, some of you, I think, have been regulars at my bourbon talks and, you know, listening to the Muckrake podcast and watching my videos on here. Uh, some of you, this might be your first time tuning in. Uh, hopefully, after we go through this thing and have a discussion about it and sort of get really in depth about what's going on in a way that the media is failing, our politicians are failing to explain uh Hopefully, once we get through this, you'll be able to. We will be able to share this video. Uh, tell people around you who are confused and frightened and frustrated exactly what is going on. Because the only way that we're going to make it out of this situation, the only way that we're going to have a better future, the only way that we're going to find something real and decent and human, is by first understanding how we've arrived at this moment, exactly what's going on. And that way we can plot a course forward. And part of the problem with politics is that we are kept from information, we are kept ignorant, and we are kept chasing phantoms and ghosts and halls of mirrors. And we have to understand what's going on in order to fight this thing. So first off, before we get going into the background of any of this and what actually took place and, and what we're actually facing right now, and it's important to point this out because a lot of people are already starting to, they're starting to try and explain away what happened on Wednesday in DC. And they're saying, oh, it was a riot that got out of control or this was a one-time incident. And I think these people tired themselves out and they just needed to act out and be angry and violent for a day. And maybe, maybe that'll be it. And maybe when we get to January 20th and Donald Trump is no longer president, maybe 
this isn't going to be something we have to deal with any longer. And maybe Trump is the problem. And when he's gone, it'll be fine. And maybe we don't need to impeach him. And maybe we really don't need consequences across the board. And maybe the people who did this will get arrested. And that will be that. I'm here to tell you that that's not true. We are at a moment of political, societal, and existential crisis. We are at a crossroads in this country. And unless we take a look at this thing and call it what it is and deal with the underlying conditions and factors, and they are huge, they are huge and they are complicated. Unless we deal with those, this thing's just gonna get worse. What you saw can either be the high watermark of the fascist movement in America of the 21st century, because we've had past fascist movements, we'll get to that. Or it can be a precursor to something larger and worse. Because what we saw take place on Wednesday, in a lot of ways, was a little bit of a dry run. And it could have been a lot worse. If the rioters or insurgents or whatever we want to call them, if they would have come across some of their targets, and their targets included Nancy Pelosi, but it also included Mike Pence, the vice president for Trump. If they would have come across any of these people, we might be having a completely different conversation right now. If any of the explosives that were planted at the RNC, the DNC, and at the Capitol had exploded, we would be having a lot different conversation. And I have to tell you that in my research to the far right, the places that I've been looking over the past couple of days, this situation's only getting worse. Tensions are only growing. The people are only in, more emboldened. They're only, uh, they're only planning larger things and they're being open about it. And a lot of people have reached out to me because I've been talking about this for a few years now. I was reporting on Trump rallies in 2015 and then I was reporting on them in 2016. And I was trying to tell people what I kept hearing at these rallies, which is that we had a growing fascistic movement in this country. It's only getting worse and none of it is hidden. It's, it's all right there to see. The problem is that we have been involved in an unbelievably unhealthy, disastrous delusion of where we are and what is happening in this country. The denial that I'm talking about, and before we get into this whole thing, again, this was an attempted coup. This was a pooch. This was a group of people who under the command and inspiration of the president of the United States of America, who, by the way, should be impeached immediately, should be removed from office, and should be imprisoned for sedition, not to mention God knows how many other crimes. They went to the U.S. Capitol not to terrorize legislatures. They went to stop the process of transition of power. They went to overturn an election, an election that had no fraud, an election that was completely free and fair outside of the usual disenfranchising. They have created a conspiracy theory, which mirrors fascistic conspiracy theories throughout time that we have seen grow in size, scope and danger. And the, and the threat is only growing. So first and foremost, before we get into the underlying factors and what exactly happened on Wednesday, we have to say again definitively, this was a coup attempt. It was a pooch. This was a group of fascists that attempted to overturn an election and democracy. That's what it was. And there's a reason why our media and our politicians and our punditry, why they're having such a hard time wrapping their head around this thing. For some people, it is misplaced trust in our institutions and the myth of American exceptionalism. You've heard the term before, it can't happen here. There's an idea for whatever reason, and there are a lot of things that we can't even necessarily get into in the background of it and the inspiration and the philosophy behind it. But there is the idea that America could never possibly have a situation like this take place. Unfortunately, that's not true. America has been a bastion for proto-fascistic movements and fascistic movements since the beginning of America. We watched during the era of fascism in the 20th century, pre-World War II, we watched in America as fascist groups gain power and purchase in this country. 
We had a thriving, thriving American Nazi party, who, by the way, held a rally of like 20,000 Nazis in Madison Square Garden with pictures of George Washington and American flags standing next to swastikas and, and uh, other Nazi iconography. That's not conspiracy theory. That's not tinfoil hat. That's real deal history. That took place. We had a massive American first movement in this country that was led by an American hero by the name of Charles Lindbergh, who published widely, spoke constantly about the need to join Adolf Hitler and protect the white race. This was before, of course, Pearl Harbor. Lindbergh also went after President Franklin D. Roosevelt and the media and journalists calling them fake news and claiming that they were all puppets of the Jews because America is not immune to fascism. America has a rich history of fascism. In fact, America is directly linked to the rise of the Third Reich in Nazi Germany. We shared a lot of philosophers. We shared a lot of legal documents. We had people going back and forth advising them how to set up their nation. So this is not a country that is immune to fascism. Our story tells us we are, but we are not. We are not immune to it. And we've seen it grow here. And there was a real possibility that unless action was taken in the middle of the 20th century, that we could have very well seen a larger more dangerous fascistic movement in this country. What we're dealing with right now is a neo-fascistic movement. That's important for us to state. Another reason why people do not want to wrap their heads around this is because the moment that you start realizing that fascism is possible in America and that we have a burgeoning fascistic movement in this country right now is it starts to undermine their entire worldview. A lot of politicians and a lot of media members and a lot of members of the punditry are people who have been born and raised and lived their lives in incredible wealth, comfort, and privilege. For them to start dealing with this situation, which, by the way, is rife with white supremacy and privilege, and, and by the way, a failed meritocracy because we have a failed pseudo-businessman as president who has failed his entire life at everything he's ever done. Once you start investigating these things, once you start pulling those strings, that sweater starts unraveling. That garment starts coming apart. So right now we have a problem. And I've, I've been yelling about this for years and other people have too. And we've, we've been called hysterical, even though all we've done is investigated facts and talked about history. Nothing I'm going to say today has anything to do with fever dreamed hysteria or with, again, tinfoil hattery. Everything I'm getting ready to talk about is based in history that you can find in any book, and it's just underneath the surface. But these are stories that we have not been told. This is a situation that we have not been told, and it's for a reason. Because when we start understanding our situation and we start having a common language and a common history and a common understanding, we start engaging in solidarity. And the people who have created this situation do not want us to have those things and they do not want us to have solidarity. They do not want us to understand what is going on. What has happened in this country is that our political reality is not real. Like a wrestling match, like a lie within a lie. We have been fed a spectacle, something to watch on our TV with characters, villains, messiahs, demons, whatever you want to call it. This is not actually how our political system works. It's an entertainment. And once you start peeling back the layers, you start understanding that our government has been more or less bought off for the power and purchase of the wealthy and the powerful in this country. You know this as well as I do. There's a reason why we are frustrated at this moment. There's a reason why this moment is so tense. The problem is that we are at a moment where our government no longer serves the people in any material way, shape, or form. We've watched this, by the way, come to a boil during this pandemic. This should have been something that our government should have taken care of. This should have been something that it headed off at the past. It should have been something where they addressed the material conditions we are living in. We should be taken care of. We're supposedly the richest, most powerful, advanced nation in the world. Well, we're not. 
What you watch around this country is that life expectancies are going down. Infant mortality is going up. We're actually falling apart. America is starting to falter. That's what's happening at this moment. We are watching the American empire or hegemony or whatever you want to call it. It is starting to run out of gas. We are in a moment of crisis. And here is the problem. The problem is that the wealthy and the powerful arrange everything in order to control circumstances and then to empower and enrich themselves. And it has happened to such an extent that all of the... Uh, all of the profit and the power has been dammed up. It's not free markets. That's what they hide behind. They'll tell you it's free markets, but it's never actually been about free markets. It's about damming up free markets and making sure that monopolies take over. And eventually what ends up happening, and this happened, by the way, in the late 1970s, 1980s. It began with Ronald Reagan, and then it moved through. What happened with Ronald Reagan is he came in and said, oh, it's about trickle down. It's about give the wealthy people more money because they're the, they're the best stewards of that money. They're the most capable. And then, of course, everybody else will get it when it eventually trickles down to them. That whole thing has never been true. Everybody involved with it knew it was a scam. But it kept going and going and going. And slowly they dismantled the American government as a means of helping people. And it became a means of actually taking money from us down at the bottom and pushing it up towards the top. This is how you arrive at a moment where you have people who are, I don't know, thinking about colonizing Mars, who are funding their own private space programs, or why we can't have healthcare and why some people are on a quest to figure out how to never age and never die. We've been left behind. The American people have been left behind. We're not part of the 1% that is has their head in the stars or is engaging in whatever they want at any given time and never face consequences. The problem is it has reached a point where the austerity that has been put upon us has become untenable. It doesn't work. We're miserable. And history tells us that when people reach that point, they lash out. They fight back. They eventually... I've been doing a lot of research on a new project. Like they, they form roving mobs. They go from one town to the next, finding elites and the powerful. We all know where this goes. We all know what ends up happening. And what's more is that the rich and powerful can't help themselves to the extent that they push the economy until it destroys itself. The reason why we had a fascistic movement in this country in the 1930s into the early 1940s is because the rich and the powerful push the economy to the point that it imploded. It's what they do. It happens every single time. If you actually look through American history, our market, it implodes all the time because the rich and powerful can't help themselves. In the 1930s and 1940s, FDR and the New Deal and that entire reform movement finally started putting some brakes on this stuff. And they said, we're not going to allow you to keep driving this thing into the ground because the Great Depression nearly destroyed this country. But in times of financial crisis, in times of societal crisis, such as, such as the Great Depression, what ends up happening is that as the people start getting fed up with their material conditions, when they start fighting back, when they start coalescing and engaging in solidarity and grassroots movement, when the left starts threatening the capitalistic monopoly and total uh, possession of power, what do they do? What do they do? They end up relying on fascists as the muscle who make sure that the left never figures it out and are never able to come out. That's why whenever you have these economic crises, you have moments where the left coalesces and the fascists come out and they beat them into oblivion. They're the muscle that makes sure that the capitalistic order is never actually threatened. And what they do is they make a devil's bargain with fascists. They start giving them power, they start helping them, they start putting them in positions where they can fight street battles against the left, where they can intimidate the left, and then they get out of control. And it happens every time the dog gets off the leash. Every time. 
They think they find useful idiots. They think they find some street gang that'll take care of things for them. And then inevitably, that street gang takes advantage of populistic, racist movements in a country and they consolidate power. This is a cycle that we have seen over and over and over again. And it has taken place in this country once more. What has happened in this country? And if let's go back to 2010, just a recent example of this, but we've seen it over and over again. In 2010, in order to try and stifle Barack Obama, who, by the way, was never the raging leftist that everybody made him out to be or Fox News made him out to be. That was a boogeyman, straw man type situation. In order to try and stifle center left at the most reform in this country, the wealthy and powerful, particularly billionaire libertarians like the Koch brothers, invested ungodly amounts of money in the Tea Party and created it and structured it and trained them and aimed them like a weapon. And they did all of that in order to scuttle just modest to center left improvements in the country. And that is what happened in 2010 when the Tea Party happened. And do you know what the Republican Party did? And by the way, the Republican Party has flirted with this stuff for decades now since civil rights. They realized that the Tea Party was a threat on their right. So they had a choice. They would either be overtaken by the Tea Party and possibly lose power and influence, or they could absorb them and become the Tea Party, the Republican Tea Party. So that's what they did. So after 2010, you had a Republican Party that kept moving further and further right, embracing white supremacy and white supremacist paranoia. And all of this, by the way, is powered by white supremacist paranoia and these conspiracy theories that have been the same since the beginning of so-called Western civilization. I'm working on this project right now. This goes back to ancient Rome. This goes back to the Middle Ages. It's the same song and dance constantly. Here is the conspiracy theory. And tell me if this sounds familiar. The idea is that a country is chosen by God. Like, I don't know, like American exceptionalism, the idea that we were ordained by God to be his champion in the universe. And so anything that we did meant that it was good and perfect. We were serving God. We were the heroes of civilization. So how in the world could a country that was chosen by God, given the grace of God, was a divine agent of God, how could any country like that ever have a setback? How could you ever lose a war in Southeast Asia? How could you ever have an economy that occasionally goes a little bit uh, akimbo? Well, the answer is there's a satanic conspiracy, obviously. And the satanic conspiracy, this conspiracy theory, which has been present throughout the history of Western civilization, works like this. At the top, you have a, a satanic influence. Sometimes it's Satan himself. Other times it's a stand-in using the, the Jewish people, Jewish puppet masters, so to speak. Then... The other part of the triangle is you have traitorous liberals who just hate, hate America or hate the country and they hate capitalism. They want to get rid of it and they want to find socialism or something else. The other side of it, because this is a white supremacist paranoid conspiracy theory, is our people of color who don't know any better. Right. Because, you know, they need taken care of by a paternalistic white supremacist leader or overseers. And those people of color are so naive and they're taken over by this other part of the triangle, the traitors, liberals, and the puppeteer Jewish people. They're so manipulatable that they go out and they become violent. That's the conspiracy theory that has motivated all of these proto-fascistic, fascistic movements in order to protect capitalistic order and the myths of exceptionalism in America and otherwise. That's it. Those, that's where those conspiracy theories come from. And we are currently absolutely drowning in those conspiracy theories right now. That goes back. And by the way, I traced it back to ancient Rome, right through the Middle Ages for the Crusades. And eventually the plague, by the way, which is a little thing here, they actually believed that the plague was kind of a conspiracy uh, between the Jews and traitors inside. But that's neither here nor there. I traced that through there. I traced it, of course, through Nazi Germany, where we have the myth of the knife in the back. 
which, by the way, after World War I, after Germany lost that war, they believed they were an exceptional country. How could they ever lose a war? Well, obviously, they were betrayed, and it was the Jews, and it was the traitorous liberals. And then, of course, people of color. Then you trace it forward from the protocols of the elders of Zion. You go forward, and then in the 1980s, 1990s, when you start having the construction of globalism and free trade, you reach a point in America where all of a sudden the factories start going away. All of a sudden, people like my family who work in factories, their jobs start going away. Well, you could explain to them the very, very complicated world of free trade and globalism. And by the way, while we're on the subject, the entire point of free trade and globalism is, well, you know, in America, you got to pay people too much money to work. And also you have all these pesky regulations. Let's go ahead and take that factory and move it to another country. We'll have them do it and we won't pay them anything. We'll basically have them do slave labor. We won't have any regulations either. And then, you know, we don't have to worry about it being taxed and tariffed and we'll move it around. The problem is this, eventually you gotta make more money. So eventually as jobs start falling apart here in America, you gotta start paying Americans less. You gotta get rid of uh, things like any healthcare that they might actually have. You gotta get rid of things like social security and regulations and age restrictions on who's allowed to work and when they're allowed to work. So eventually you gotta always grow and grow and grow. So eventually you gotta break the backs of the people inside of America which is what's happening right now, there are these incredible fictions that they've created, right? These contractor ideas where you can work for Lyft and Uber or Instacart or any of these sort of things, and they don't have to give you anything. And on top of that, you don't have to worry about 40 hours a week either. You can work 120 hours. And by the way, we'll do a story about you on the internet and talk about you like you're a hero. So the New World Order conspiracy theory of the 1980s, 1990s was just protocols of the elders of Zion with a new coat of paint. The problem was that Bill Clinton in the 1990s and the Democratic Party had made a political decision. After they lost to Ronald Reagan in 1984, they made a political decision that they were never going to defeat the Republicans if they continued representing the working class and trade unions and people of color. If you actually go back and you look at the stories and all the quotes from that time, they say it outright. They're like, we're not going to worry about that stuff anymore. And what actually happened in this country was we came to a point of economic consensus. The Democrats and the Republicans would have fights about things like abortion, transgender rights, those types of, of cultural discussions. But the economic discussion was pretty much done. Occasionally, they would have debates about who deserved tax cuts here and there, or maybe some modest, you know, reformation here or there. But you had a lot of Democrats who still were like, well, we're not going to worry about this. Businesses, we should, we should help business. The economy is absolutely important. That's where we're going to worry about this stuff. But the Republicans still told the lie of the conspiracy theory, particularly Newt Gingrich and the contract with America people and Rush Limbaugh. They kept peddling this idea, which, by the way, was also the Red Scare with a new paint, paint job. So what ended up happening is the New World Order conspiracy theory, which was just a, a simplified version, a simplified explanation of what actually happened with our economy, then morphed into the deep state. The deep state, by the way, and we have to have this conversation, it's long overdue, the deep state resonates with people because there's a, there's a nugget of truth to it. Now, there's not some sort of deep state cabal and there's not these pedophiles that the QAnon people will tell you that there are. and There's none of that type of stuff. There is the remaining consensus that we have talked about from the 1980s, 1990s onward. The economic consensus among Democrats and Republicans that they'll fight about these cultural wars and they'll kind of agree on how the economy should be serviced and, and how big business and the wealthy and the powerful should be serviced. But they also have a consensus when it comes to national security. That's why the wars didn't end after 2003. That's why they kept going and going and going, because the American project of hegemony had to continue. It didn't matter who was in the White House. We were still going to drone strike people. We were still going to extradite you know, terrorists and send them to places where they could be tortured. We were still going to continue to build the surveillance state. 
That's the deep state. That's what that is. And there is a nugget of truth to it. But what has been sold to the American people is a complete fabrication. The deep state conspiracy theory is just the New World Order conspiracy theory. It's just the protocols of the elders of Zion conspiracy theory. Just a new coat of paint each time. What we have seen here, and now we get to Donald John Trump. Donald Trump is a figurehead. He's a grifter. This whole thing, the deep state thing, building the wall, all of these conversations, they're not real. He never intended to build the wall. He never intended to, to drain the swamp. He wanted in on it. He wanted to make money from it. He wanted to dismantle America and sell it off for spare parts. He wanted to make a little scratch while he was at it. And that's what he did because he is a grifter. Internally, he's actually a fascist. His natural instincts are to be a fascist. And so as a result, he acts like a fascist and he behaves like a fascist. But all of these conspiracy theories were just an easy way to further the grift. And that's what's happened. And Donald Trump went out and spoke to a lot of people who have a pretty good reason to be pissed off. And this is one of the great lessons of this entire situation. Americans have a real reason to be pissed off. We actually do. And we have a reason to come together and talk about this stuff. But the conversation that Trumpists are having is not real. They're chasing shadows. They're chasing illusions. They're lost in the grift, in the conspiracy theory. Because these conspiracy theories, remember, they are simplified explanations of larger problems. It just so happens that when the wealthy and powerful get a hold of conspiracy theories, they can use them to keep people from having a conversation about larger actual issues. People have a right to be pissed off. We live in a country with enforced artificial austerity. We live in a country where our government has been bought and sold by the powerful and the wealthy. Those things are true. We've also been completely pushed out of representative government. These people want to get beyond elections. There's a reason why they're fighting over the results of an election. They don't want that anymore. And the people who broke into the Capitol, there are different types of them. There are different groupings of them. But a lot of them are lost in a conspiracy theory that has been designed. And I'm talking here about QAnon. It has been designed to throw them off the scent of what's actually happening and to manipulate them into doing what the wealthy and the powerful want them to do. So instead of us coalescing, Instead of us having a conversation about actual conditions, actual history, actual events, we are being divided by artificial conspiracy theories. And it's the same one from the past. QAnon is a fascistic conspiracy theory. It has the exact same triangle conspiracy theory behind it that all fascist movements have. And remember that fascism, Fascism is the guardian of capitalistic power and inequality. Okay? QAnon, which a lot of these people who showed up at the Capitol, a lot of them who broke into it, believe that they live in a situation where puppet masters have taken control of the media. They don't always say Jews. Some of them say Jews, but most of them avoid saying it. That there are puppet masters who control the media and will not let anyone know the truth that there are traitorous liberals, many of them pedophiles, who are part of the reason why America is failing. And then you have these people of color like Black Lives Matter or Antifa, you got to throw them in there with it too, who are so naive that they're being manipulated and they're being violent. It's the same fascistic triangle conspiracy theory narrative. Instead of having a conversation about power, and wealth and what is actually taking place in this country. They are out live action role playing like they're revolutionaries. This is why you saw so many people in the Capitol make it into the chambers and then just stand there. There's no actual ideology. QAnon tells them that eventually the evildoers and the criminals and the cabal or whatever, eventually they'll be rounded up and they'll be executed. And some of them might, 
have done it if they had the chance. That's what happened. You have another group who got in there who are Trumpists who just kind of found themselves in there. And you saw them. There's pictures of them. They're just walking around live streaming themselves, which, by the way, a lot of them are involved in grifts where they have, I don't know, YouTube parlor accounts. They had Twitter accounts yesterday, but now they're gone, which they were just trying to play live action role play being revolutionaries. But I'll tell you who else was involved in that crowd. A lot of military, a lot of law enforcement, a lot of ex-military, ex-law enforcement. You had people who broke into the Capitol on Wednesday who were looking to kidnap people, probably to steal information. Turns out they probably did. We've already heard that there were members of law enforcement there, members of the military. What we see with fascistic movements, particularly fascistic movements that take off and actually succeed, is you have large groups of veterans who get pissed off about what's going on in the country and they don't want to leave it to democratic judgment anymore. There's a reason why Adolf Hitler, a veteran of World War I, and you had a lot of them, by the way, a lot of veterans in Italy as well, a lot of people who are involved in a lot of wars who get tired of democracy. They get tired of people making decisions for them. And so they start acting in a fascistic manner. That's kind of interesting in a time in America where we have been involved in forever wars since 2001. Think about that. Think about how many veterans we've created in this country. And then, by the way, left them behind, didn't take care of them made sure that they didn't get their benefits, that they, they weren't actually taken care of. So we have a thriving militaristic, and by the way, they were all told at some point or another that they were members of a crusade. And the crusades are a white supremacist movement. And they get back here, and all of a sudden the government's not helping them, not doing anything. This is how movements happen. What happened on Wednesday was an actual attempt to overthrow the election of 2020. But it was also a means of trying to bring together a movement. And that's what we're seeing here. We are seeing a movement start to coalesce. If this was just some people acting up, if this was just some people if this was just some people live action role playing, then it just would have stopped, particular, particularly after the arrest started. But that's not what's happening. What we're watching is a movement that is coalescing. They already have a martyr. That young woman who was killed, who was a veteran, by the way, they've already started lionizing her. They've already started talking about avenging her honor. And if you look back to past fascistic movements, such as the Beer Hall Pooch of the 1920s, a lot of these people try things. And they fail. And after they fail, if people die, by the way, interesting little side, side little tidbit, after the Beer Hall Pooch, you had some Nazis who died in that pooch, who tried to take over the government but didn't get there. People died and they bled on a flag. They ended up calling it the blood flag. Go check that out if you get a chance. All, the, all of those people were treated as martyrs. And actually that blood flag became a holy relic of the Third Reich. She's already being heralded as a martyr. They've already put together iconography. There's some really spooky stuff out there if you want to go look. They're already talking about what they want to do. They're already talking about marching on Washington with weapons. They're talking about executing people. I've talked to a few people, a few journalists, a few politicians who have already started receiving escalating threats, which, by the way, we've been threatened for years, which no one wanted to take seriously because everyone said this is just online. That's all it is. It's not all online. Online is real life and real life is online. The two have blended, particularly in this age of misinformation and, and, and manipulation. They're talking about mass slaughter. They're talking about mass executions. And that idea isn't new. When I was writing American Rule, I had to go and read the Turner Diaries, which, by the way, 
inspired a guy named Timothy McVeigh, another veteran who served in the Persian Gulf War, a completely fabricated war in which we had to fight a dictator who was armed with weapons that we gave him and intelligence that we gave him. He went to the Persian Gulf War and was radicalized while he was over here, came back and found the Patriot Movement, which, by the way, was inspired by the New World Order. He was inspired by a thing called the Turner Diaries. And one of the, and, and by the way, like there's a scene in the Turner Diaries where the revolutionaries, to strike against the New World Order, they, they go and they blow up a federal building. McVeigh used that scene and the directions involved in it to bomb Oklahoma City. The Turner Diaries, which is still the Bible of the white supremacist movement in this country, talks about a thing called the Day of the Rope, which is where they take, surprise, surprise, the Jewish people, the manipulators, the puppet masters, the traitorous liberals, and people of color who are being manipulated into violence. They hang them all across the country. Kill them. Wipe them out. And then they have an ongoing revolution and war. The people who storm the Capitol are a bunch of different people. A bunch of different people. You had QAnon people who are engaged in, you know, this fascistic conspiracy theory. You had the MAGA cultists who believe that Trump is an actual answer to all this stuff. And Trump is not. Trump is a symptom. He's not the disease. It's not going to end when he's gone. He didn't create this. He cultivated it. He turned the temperature up on it. He's a symptom. He's not the disease. But you also had white supremacists and white extremists who are very interested in overturning this government. And let me tell you something. Having a president who isn't Donald Trump and who doesn't at least pay lip service to their cause, that actually helps a white supremacist and white terrorist and white separatist and accelerationist. There's a reason why all that took place during Bill Clinton's presidency. It's going to get worse. Chances are it'll probably they will probably see some stuff come up here pretty soon, and it's going to get worse and worse and worse the longer that we don't deal with this. So here's what we got to understand. What took place was not just a spontaneous riot that spilled into the Capitol. This is a long time coming. This has been a situation that has been cultivated by the wealthy and powerful in this country who have used conspiracy theories to keep us from talking to one another and understanding the truth. And by the way, it's, it's made, it's led to a situation where they own our, our government, where they've been able to consolidate wealth and power. Some of them astroturf these groups. They take on education. They, they take, they take on anything that could possibly be good for actual people. That's one part of this thing. You also have the Republican Party who has been the servant of those people for so long it's hard to even remember where it started. They've been engaging in the undermining of truth and facts and reality. You think that they don't know global warming's real? You think they don't know there's a climate catastrophe coming? Absolutely they do. They lie in bad faith. They've been cultivating this base the Trump base, the extremist base that we're talking about right now, they rely on them like a leg on a stool. Also, this attack was aided by the administration. Everything that we saw on Wednesday, Trump either told them to go do it or the administration didn't actually react to what was happening. What we saw on Wednesday, no joke, was the president of the United States attacking his own vice president in the legislative branch. Mull that over a little bit. We also have white supremacists in this country. A lot of them are dedicated to overthrowing the government and creating a white fascistic ethnostate in the vein of the Third Reich of Nazi Germany. They will use any situation to their advantage. This entire time, by the way, with Donald Trump, they have been they have been recruiting and organizing like crazy. On top of that, by the way, just to go ahead and let you know exactly how big and bad this is, they've been coordinating and communicating with other far right white supremacist groups around the world. All right. 
We are in a moment which looks a hell of a lot like the 1920s and 1930s. The economy is getting ready to fall apart. These people understand that they have a real opportunity to do this. We also have in this country, of course, and I have to mention this, white identity evangelicals who believe that they're being persecuted. They believe in this apocalyptic idea, and they have come to believe that Donald Trump is a Messiah-like figure. They are led astray. They are lost in their own mirrors, which, by the way, at I'll, I'll, some point I'll do another video explainer talking about all of that. But it is a big, massive problem. This collection of people and this particular moment where uh, hyper-capitalism is starting to fall apart, where Western civilization is stretched to its point, where the myths of exceptionalism are starting to falter. And by the way, we're having this conversation. This kind of a conversation would not have been possible a few years ago. This conversation, putting these things together, putting these things together, putting the facts together, starting to talk about solidarity and understanding and action and grassroots organization, that happens when things start falling apart and we start realizing that we've been lied to. But when that happens, when all of a sudden people start putting things together and there's a possibility of there being change, that's when the crisis occurs and that's when capitalists rely on fascists as their muscle. That's where we are right now. We need to talk about solutions, though. There are larger solutions, and I always bring these up. It's not in order just to be a pundit and not just to say things. My hope is eventually stuff like what we're talking about today will build in terms of a message, like a seed that is being watered and will grow. It'll lead to conversations. And eventually the people who can actually affect the larger change that I'm talking about on the political level, then hopefully they can get a hold of it and maybe it can get to them and maybe it can make some sense. But also we have to, we have to realize that politics is not top down. We also need to remember that we are not powerless and that we are not alone, and we need grassroots organization and solidarity, because that's the only way that these movements actually coalesce and that they actually gain purchase and change things. So first things first, on the national level, the Democrats have to stop playing around with this thing. The Democrats have been telling the same mythology, retelling the same myths as the Republican Party for decades. And this goes back to what I was saying about the economic consensus. The Democratic Party in the 1980s with Ronald Reagan came to believe that they could not actually critique America or its structure or its founding or, or its foundations. They could never do that and actually win. But we've reached a new point now. We've reached a new point where people are starting to see through the threadbare nature of our mythology and all of our foundations, and they know it's not real. We can start having mature conversations that aren't about eagles and flags and fireworks. There's a reason why when Trump hugs a flag or when on the 4th of July where he did an address in front of Mount Rushmore, why it felt bad. Trump has made it obvious that those things are not real. Those are symbols. And the right is obsessed with symbolic gestures at this point. Eagles, fireworks, uh, talking about, you know, shadow bands or what, whatever this stuff is. Uh, the, the war on Christmas, all that stuff. The rest of us are starting to open our eyes. And we're like, those symbols don't mean anything. Are we going to have a government that represents us or are we not? And on top of that, we understand that the founders were not divine and perfect. They were slaveholding white wealthy men. The Democratic Party needs to move beyond their reliance on those mythologies. They need to call this a fascist movement. And by the way, the Republicans constantly score points against Democrats by calling them socialists and radicals and communists because those old labels still have some carte blanche. They're going away, by the way. Americans are starting to embrace things like socialism and radicalism. But let me tell you something. That idea of fascism, that still holds a lot of power among the electorate and among the people. And this is a fascistic movement. Call it as much. Say that this is fascism. 
Because as long as you sit around and talk about, oh, these people, there's a few of them that aren't great, and most people are good, and America is mostly good, all of a sudden people are like, this doesn't sound like there's a crisis going on. This sounds like a situation. It'll pass. A lot like a school shooting where a cable news channel goes and sits for a couple days, and then they go through the whole pageant where they talk to people and they heal and they, they hold a, a memorial and then it's over. This is a crisis. And the Democrats are not acting like it's a crisis. Punditry, not acting like it's a crisis. Media, not acting like it's a crisis. They're acting like it's a moment. It's not. It's a crisis. Call it what it is. Because you cannot address a crisis when you're pretending that there's no crisis. You cannot do incremental stuff. You can't play these games. You can't say the president of the United States is a clear and present danger and then leave Washington, D.C. without impeaching him. Because if he needs to be removed for our safety, he should not be in office another day. And he shouldn't. Donald Trump should be impeached immediately, removed from office, put in jail. Period. You can't have him. By the way, the idea that you're going to handle an unhinged, president of the United States with the nuclear codes by telling generals not to take his orders. That's a, that, that's a coup in and of its own right. You need to treat this like the actual crisis that it is. The second thing that you have to do politically, you have to start addressing the material conditions that have led to the radicalization of America. You have to start actually helping with things like health care. With education, you have to uh, you have to get past artificial austerity. And the only reason that we have artificial austerity is because they don't want people expecting the government to help. And also because they need to fund the military industrial complex and American hegemony. We need to start rolling that stuff back. We need to start investing in the people again. We need to start talk, taking care of people again. If we start doing that, all of a sudden that alienation that frustrated nature and that feeling of powerlessness, it'll go away. It'll start to get better. I keep telling people, I, I talk to white supremacists, former white supremacists, foreign, foreign, former neo-Nazis, and they tell me that they look for frustrated, lonely, powerless young men. And they say, put on the armband, do the Nazi salute. You're not powerless anymore. You're not alone anymore. Do something big. Change the nature and feeling of this country. That is what happened in the 1930s and 1940s with FDR. The reason we were able to beat back fascism is because we changed things in this country. We unfortunately have a fascistic movement in this country. We have had fascistic movements in this country. We were barely able to keep them from taking over. And we're in that situation again. It's time for big bold measures. For us, there's a couple of things that we need to do. And I'm talking about normal citizens who say all the time, what are we supposed to do? Yes, but what do I do with this information? A couple of steps here. First and foremost, we have to get educated. This conversation that we're having right now, this is the truth. This is actually what's taking place in this country. This cuts beyond the regular red and blue, Democrat, Republican, left and right narratives that are not real. This is an actual mature conversation about what's going on in this country. If we can start having that conversation, we can start comparing notes. We can start to bond together. We can engage in solidarity, organization, and intimacy. So here's what I have to say to you. You are not powerless. A lot of people have spent a lot of money on trying to make you feel powerless. We keep seeing in American history that when the people come together and have a conversation and they form grassroots movements, they win. They change this country in massive ways. People are spending billions upon billions of dollars this year, the year before, decades now, they have spent so much money and so much power and so much time trying to make you feel powerless. Understand who it is, understand why they've done it, and understand that it's not true. You're not alone either. 
Most people feel like this. When you actually look at polls and you actually talk to people about material conditions, you actually talk to people about the business of politics, they agree on how things should work. It's that they're not having conversation. It used to be that if you worked in a factory or a mine or a place together, you had conversations with the people around you. You got to check notes with each other. You talk about your boss, the treatment you were getting, how much money you were being paid, how, the things that you had been told. That was solidarity. That's what led to labor unions. That's what led to movements. We don't live in that society anymore. We're alienated. We're not necessarily working next to one another. We're also, by the way, kept absolutely terrified as hell to talk to other people about how much we're making because we're economic competitors against each other. I can't trust you because I, if I trusted you, you might make one over on me. You might take a piece of my pie or I, I need to go ahead and take yours. The zero sum idea is killing us. Killing us. We have to get educated and we have to get organized. If you have people in your life who aren't aware of this stuff, what I'm talking about tonight, what other people who are experts in this stuff are talking about, tell them. Share things like this video. Hand them a book. And I know people really don't even have that much time to read anymore or actually get in depth on this stuff. Do it however you can. Spread the word because this ignorance is killing us. It's literally allowing moneyed, powerful, wealthy interest to divide us. And it's leading to a point of not just austerity, it's making our lives last long, uh, less. We're dying earlier. We're more miserable. We're more stressed. And by the way, we're reaching a point of, of utter frustration. That's why we're watching the protests. That's why, that's why we're having these moments of, of tension and strife. We're being squeezed. We're pushed to the point where we just can't take it anymore. And what happens when that starts happening? You reach a point of capitalistic crisis and the capitalists, they start supporting fascists. It's the people who come in and they make sure that people aren't engaging in solidarity, that they're not talking to one another, that they're not gaining purchase or momentum. You have to talk to people. Tell people about what we talked about tonight. Do not let people underplay what took place this week. That was a coup attempt. That was a pooch. We are watching a fascistic movement take place in this country because capitalism and nationalism is in a place of crisis. And they will get off their chain and it's going to get worse. It's going to be a lot of blood split and a lot of blood spread. I, it's it's going to get so bad if we're not careful. It's going to get so bad if we're not careful and if we don't do something. We have to start talking. We have to start getting educated. And we have to start start organizing. Thanks for coming out for this. Um, I'm going to do more of this as, uh, as situations arise, unfortunately. But please let people know what we're talking about here. Uh, you know, there are a lot of us who are talking about this stuff. A lot of us are talking about this stuff, and we, uh, we're, we're trying to get word out about it. We've been yelling about it for years. Please let people know. Let them know what's actually happening in this country. Um, I'm going to sign off here in just a second. Tomorrow night, 8 p.m. Eastern, uh, I'll be back on this channel. I'm doing a bourbon talk. I'll answer questions, engage in a, uh, a less formal discussion. I appreciate all of you. Stay safe.